Uh, yes, you can, but I'm going to introduce you. Okay. Uh, so you can see my slides, right? Uh, make it full. Yeah, now it's a full screen. That's yeah. awesome. Okay, let me let me uh, start the seminar. Okay, uh, welcome to the DD, DDPS seminar, everyone. Before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics as usual. Uh, first of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you do have questions, clarify clarification questions. You're welcome to unmute yourself and ask those questions. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, uh, the today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences and therefore no classified discussion is allowed. Uh, of course, um, um, please, uh, so watch out for, for that. And finally, the talk today will be recorded and up uploaded in our uh, YouTube channel. Um, so that's about it. Now let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, it is an honor to host Professor Javier Antil, uh, who is a professor in Department of Mathematical Sciences and founder and director of Center for uh, Mathematics and Artificial Intelligence at George Mason University. Currently, there are many exciting things going on in the center. Uh, so please check that out uh, when you get a chance. Um, he got his PhD in applied mathematics at University of Houston, uh, Texas in 2009. Prior to joining George Mason University, he was a postdoctoral uh, post researcher at Rice University. Uh, his research interests include algorithm development for PDE constraint optimization, deep learning, artificial intelligence and dimensional reduction. Okay, today Javier will present applications of fractional operators from optimal control to machine learning, which is a great interest to us. Uh, so please enjoy and expect a wonderful talk from Javier. Uh, now, without further ado, let me pass the button to Javier uh, by asking one random question uh, to make the stage somewhat comfortable for both speakers and audiences. Today's random question is, what is the most beautiful place you ever you ever visited or seen? Uh, I would say the, the German Alps. So that's the most prettiest place I've been to. Oh, where is it? I never heard of it. Uh, German Alps. So like in, in uh, south of Munich, you have uh, uh, Alps mountains, right? So that's oh, like oh, okay, okay, okay. beautiful, beautiful place. Indeed, indeed. I totally agree with you. Okay, uh, it's all yours, Javier. Thank you, uh, Jung Su, for 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 this very uh, kind introduction and also um, inviting me and giving this opportunity. Um, so, and and thanks to to the audience also uh, for 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 being part of this session. So, as uh, Jung Su mentioned. So today I will discuss some of our work that we've been doing for last, uh, I would say three, three and a half years on, on, on fractional operators. This is one of the uh, research topic in our group. Uh, we, we do have several other things and I'm happy to uh, describe them to you if you're interested. Uh, this work is partially supported by National Science Foundation and also Air Force Office of Scientific Research and Department of Navy Naval Postgraduate School. So, um, as Jungs mentioned earlier, there are there are a few things that we we are there are several initi initi initiatives going on un under our Center for Mathematics and Artificial Intelligence, and just to advertise a couple of them, I didn't prepare any slides, but I can just mention to you guys. Uh, so we run a weekly colloquium. Uh, we are on a little break at the moment during the summer, but there are a couple of couple of activities that we have planned. Uh, one is a summer school on uh, June 18th on uh, risk covers PD constraint optimization. And then there we are also doing a, an event together with um, uh, several industries and national labs on June 25th. If you're interested in attending those, um, those are just half a day events each. Uh, please let me know. Um, all right, so let's continue. So I'm, I'm going to start with some of the applications of uh, fractional order operators uh, before I get into a more mathematical details. 
So why 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 do we care about these 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 operators? Let me uh, start by discussing the more classical application. One one uh, application that many many people care about is the so-called image denoising problem. So the issue is that you are given a noisy image f, and you want to do a reconstruction u, and you want to get rid of the noise, um, and you do that by using the so-called total variation regularization. So here I wrote it formally as the the L1 norm of the gradient of U, but this should be understood in the so-called distribution sense. Um, you could, if you if you for if you are allowed to formally at least you can write uh, the the uh, euler Lagrange equations corresponding to this this problem, and you observe that that you get an unknown linear partial differential equation and which can be degenerate. Still, people are writing uh, um, papers in this to solve this problem, even though model was introduced by Rudin, Osher, and Patami in 1992. And the issue is, is this problem is still quite challenging from a numerical point of view. A few years ago, in 2017, around yeah, three years ago, three and a half years ago, together with uh, my uh, collaborator, Soren Bartels from University of Freiburg in, in Germany, we replaced this total variation uh, semi norm by uh, this object delta s over 2 where this s will be my fractional exponent uh, i will assume that s is between 0 and 1 and now let's look at this minimization problem if i write if i take the variation with respect to u and i write uh, the euler lagrange equation we get a linear uh, pde so we have replaced a highly nonlinear degenerate model by a linear model. Now you may say that you have to solve a, a more challenging problem with the fractional Laplacian, but my claim is that it's not so challenging, especially for this particular application, because typically images are given on square or rectangular type domains. So you can in fact just use the Fourier transform and, and FFT and IFFT in MATLAB and do this very, very quickly, just like five or six lines of code. And that's what we did. So if you start with a noisy image F, this is the original image, I added some noise to that. If you start with noisy image like this, and if you solve this, this equation with an exponent, I think in this example was like 0.4, uh, we get a recovery uh, like this, and the one on the right is the recovery using total variation approach, where we even optimize over this regularization parameter alpha uh, over there. And it takes a while actually to solve this problem. On the other hand, this one was extremely quick, like 0 0.01 second or something like that. So, and, and we can still preserve these sharp features. So for example, the collar uh, is not being smoothed out um, so what is telling us that the fractional operators are imposing uh, less uh, smoothness compared to the classical operator. In fact, they are, they are good in capturing this sharp transition across interfaces. We still have to identify the exponent S and the regularization parameter alpha. Um, you can do that by creating a bi-level optimization um, framework, which we recently did um, in, a, in a paper, which I forgot to... Uh, mention actually, there, there, I forgot to add a reference here, but it's a paper together with a PhD student of mine, um, a former PhD student of mine. So where we identify this exponent s and alpha in a bi-level optimization framework, uh, motivated by by um, some 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 machine learning uh, problems. So in particular, residual neural network. I will not get into too much detail on on that at the moment. So and then we were a bit more adventurous. So this is working so well. Um, and let's try to see if we can push this further. So and what we did was we make this S not a constant anymore, but is a make is a function of X spatial variable. And we allow it to touch extreme values of zero and one. So if you have jump discontinuities, you want to set as close to zero as possible. And in away from the jump discontinuities, you want to set it close to one. For example, if you look at such a noisy image, uh, along the jump discontinuities, you will set it to be zero, then you're just imposing, uh, you're not imposing any smoothness, you just have L2 functions. And in the flat regions, like here, you set it close to one, then you're enforcing H1 uh, smoothness, and um, you want to get rid of the noise altogether. So this is a very adaptive model in some sense. 
we did that, we have a way to even identify this exponent as uh, for this imaging application. And uh, we, we get such a recovery, the one on the right hand side, so almost a perfect recovery. And the middle one is the recovery that you get using a uh, total variation approach, where you notice that the the corners are 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 getting rounded a little bit, and that's an artifact uh, for using total variation approach. It's it's known in the literature. So we are seeing that the this this approach of of fractional operators is is working uh, reasonably well for data science type problems, and uh, this work in particular is published in Siam Journal of Math Analysis. It required developing several new analysis tools. We have further extended um, uh, this use of non-local operators to the so-called uh, fractional diffusion maps. And so you have, you're given a cloud of data and you're trying to fit a manifold through the data. So instead of using the, the, the usual uh, heat kernel that, that people use in, in diffusion maps, we work with these uh, non-local kernels because fractional Laplacian is a non-local operator. Um, and that allows us to, in fact, uh, see some interesting features. This work is just got accepted in Applied Computational and Harmonic Analysis Journal. I'd be happy to discuss more details if you're interested. So these are the applications from, from data science point of view of, of using these fractional operators or non-local operators. Now let's go to the physics. So um, here, uh, together with couple of guys from Sandia Labs, uh, Bartman Bloom and Wonders, who works in optimization, and also Chad Weiss, who's a geophysicist. Uh, we looked at a problem of so-called magnetolorics, which is uh, inferring the electrical conductivity in the earth from surface measurements. And typically, uh, one starts with the 3D Maxwell's equations and derive Helmholtz equation and uh, solve those 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 equations to 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 capture the 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 behavior of this problem or to capture physics. Uh, what we did was we started with the 3D Maxwell's equations and we used a different constitutive relationship and we arrive at the so-called fractional Helmholtz equation. So if you know Helmholtz equation, instead of standard Laplacian, you have uh, this Laplacian to the power S, minus Laplacian to the power S. And then we were wondering if this, this model really correspond to some real geophysics uh, application and we implemented, uh, we, we, we did the simulations. And so here I'm plotting the so-called apparent resistivity versus frequency. Uh, I mean, this is not so important. What's, what's interesting is to look at these curves. It's well known that for classical case with the standard Laplacian, uh, you get a curve like this, the flat curve. With the different fractional exponents, we saw this uh, bell shape. Um, curves and then we were wondering if if this really corresponds to a realistic data and we did find uh, a realistic data so apparently there are these magnet magnetic stations all over the, the united states we looked at the open source data from this station located in the state of kansas and qualitatively our our numerical results matches uh, almost perfectly with 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 the numeric uh, with, with 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 the experimental results actually so that's an application from from the physics uh, side so, I mean, more recently we have looked at more um, more challenging problems. So one is the so-called fractional harmonic maps. This is a, a this problem is very well known and widely used in physics, in particular in uh, ferromagnetism, where you're trying to minimize. So in the classical case, you'll minimize the Dirichlet energy gradient of u square, uh, subject to uh, some constraints that you want to stay on the surface of the sphere, that is, you impose the unit length constraints. Uh, it's used, this, this idea is used in, in ferromagnetism, in, in, in modeling of liquid crystals, in, uh, in describing inextensible rods and unshareable plates, in uh, continuum mechanics, and in uh, quantum mechanics to, to capture spin dynamics. So what we did was we replaced the, the gradient of u square by, by fractional Laplacian. So we get a different uh, energy now. And it makes sense because what you're really interested in in these problems is capture singularity. And I will, I will describe that in a second. So one way to solve this problem and uh, is using the so-called gradient flow. So you look at the energy and you look at the, the, the dynamics applied to that energy or, or sort of gradient descent method. 
And notice that this is a highly nonlinear uh, partial differential equation because this um, Lagrange multiplier lambda, which corresponds to this uh, equality constraint, uh, depends nonlinearly on u. Uh, in the classical case, you can show that lambda is like gradient of um, the L1, little L1 norm of gradient of u. And this is what I was saying that you have a non-local. Um, so, so, so you this these problems have singularity. So, if you start with uh, some some boundary conditions, or in this case, exterior conditions of x or mod x, typically you are supposed to develop a singularity in the middle of the domain. And that's what happens uh, with the with an exponent which is 0.4 fractional exponent 0.4. We see a, sing, a a point singularity. So this is known as the point defect. If you take smaller values of s, then you see some more non-local defect where singularities are more dispersed. And it turned out if you do if you refine your finite element mesh sufficiently enough, this this will actually disappear and it will uh, uh, converge to to a point as well. Um, at least that's that's what it seems to be happening when we when we refine the mesh. But the point is in the classical model, you have a Laplacian here and you are you are enforcing um, H1 regularity on solutions, but you still want to capture um, um, these defects which can be challenging, especially the defects which cause which are the so-called line defects. Um, but this fractional model, you're enforcing less smoothness. So they are more tailored to capture such singularities compared to the classical models. A direct application of, 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 uh, of this model is, is this quantum spin chains. And in fact, you start with your, um, your uh, Hamiltonian in, 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 a, in a quantum system. And then, you, if you write a continuum limit, you you do arrive at this uh, this this fractional uh, differential equation. It's a nonlinear equation. Um, the discrete model was was derived by these guys uh, Haldane and Shastri in in their eighty eight paper, and it's 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 used quite a lot in 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 practice. Uh, and it turned out that this model also falls in the category of the theory that we developed for the previous problem. And this is a paper that we recently submitted. Um, so I will I will not bore you further with, with with more experiments here. I just wanted to say that we have applications of these these operators, this fractional Laplacian, for example. That's the one I have discussed so far. With the constant exponent or a variable exponent, it has applications in data science, also in physics. We saw from physics point of view applications in, in, in geophysics. And now I have shown you some applications related to uh, quantum spin chains and, and also uh, fractional harmonic maps. So now let's try to define this operator. How do you how do you def how do you define a fractional Laplacian? Uh, one way to define is is relatively straightforward. You look at the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues for standard Laplacian with zero boundary conditions. And then as we do typically in finite dimensions, if you're trying to compute the powers of a positive definite matrix, you compute the eigen decomposition and you raise the eigenvalues to that power. And that's what we do. To define the fractional Laplacian, you just raise the eigenvalues to the power S. That's one way to define. This is what I'm gonna call the Dirichlet fractional Laplacian or the spectral fractional Laplacian. The other definition is the so-called integral fractional Laplacian where if you want to evaluate this object applied to you at a point X, you need to integrate uh, the function over the entire Rn. And, uh, and this clearly shows that this is a non-local operator. It's not a local operator as you have for the fractional Laplacian, as you have for the standard Laplacian where you're computing derivatives at points. But here you need to have information about the function everywhere if you want to uh, solve your problem, for instance. If I replace this Rn by omega, we get a different definition, so-called regional fractional Laplacian, but let's not worry about that too much for a moment. So the simplest problem that corresponds to this, this fractional PDE is, is, is your classical Dirichlet problem. So if we let's consider the classical Dirichlet problem with the standard Laplacian, we can impose the boundary conditions on the boundary of the domain, right? And if I try to do the same thing with fractional Laplacian, I will notice that this problem is not well posed anymore because 
this operator, uh, at least this integral fractional Laplacian require you to have information about the functions in the exterior. So, so the well, well posed problem is you impose the condition u equals to g in the exterior of the domain in Rn minus omega, not just on the boundary of the domain. Uh, this might look strange at first, but this will allow, give me, gives me more flexibility and I will come back to this point uh, later on in the talk. Uh, next, if you want to solve this problem, we need to have integration by parts formula. So we need the notion of uh, normal derivative and you can define an another integral operator which uh, converge to your classical normal derivative if you take the limit uh, from the left as going to one minus. And once you have this, you can define uh, integration by parts formula. So the classical integration by parts formula that we learn uh, in, in school is um, you have grad grad, that's your bilinear form, uh, plus uh, V is the test function uh, times Laplacian U and V times the normal derivative of, of U on the boundary. And you have an analogous result in the fractional case as well. You have a bilinear form and then you have uh, this term which corresponds to this term and then you have um, a term in the exterior which is contains this non-local normal derivative. So now we have um, everything that we need to solve these problems. So one thing we already notice is that these operators are non-local because they, they are defined in this integral sense. The other challenge is um, that these problems are inherently non-smooth and that's why they work uh, in so well in these applications that I showed you at the beginning in, in geophysics or, or in imaging where you have jump discontinuities. And here is an example. So we consider the simplest problem, uh, just the Dirichlet problem, take omega to be smooth. Let's say take a unit ball. Right hand side is just one and G is zero then we can write an explicit solution to this problem as given here. And in the classical uh, Dirichlet problem, if your data, if your domain is smooth and the right hand side is smooth, the solutions are smooth. And we notice that in this case, this is not, uh, not true anymore. So these operators uh, have inherent uh, non-smoothness and that's what makes it very challenging for them to analyze both at the theoretical level and also um, at the numerical level. Another challenge at the numerical level is uh, you have to discretize these integral operators and you have to deal with dense uh, numerical linear algebra. So I give a quick overview on the implementation aspects of these integral operators. I will not get into too much detail, but just flash this slide in case you are interested in, in the references. So once you have, if you have periodic boundary conditions, then you can use, um, uh, just the Fourier approach, like the one from our paper or this paper of uh, Ainsworth and, and, and Mao. If you use this Dirichlet fractional Laplacian or the spectral fractional Laplacian that I introduced earlier, you can, um, this works in arbitrary domains and you can impose um, boundary conditions also in an appropriate way. Um, they, they are, there are several options. Um, one is the so-called extension approach. Uh, I will not get into too much detail, but the idea is that uh, you turn your non-local problem into a local problem at the expense of adding one more uh, dimension. And, um, and, 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 and this can work in 2D and 3D as well. So it's a very nice method actually. The other approach is using the so-called Cato formula. If you use the function and calculus, uh, then you can actually arrive at um, arrive at a representation of the inverse of fractional Laplacian, which can be implemented very easily uh, just by solving the standard Poisson uh, equations. If you are interested in implementing this, you can download the code um, from my website. Uh, the other approach is you compute the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions for standard Laplacian. Uh, but we know that that can be challenging in arbitrary domains and it's not clear how many eigenfunctions you need to compute. So I won't uh, recommend that in general. For the integral fraction Laplacian, there are a few approaches. Uh, one is this FAM-based approach originally by uh, Acosta uh, and Juan Pablo Bordagray. Um, and this, this works quite well actually, and they have developed, they've done a remarkable job uh, in, in analyzing this as well. 
uh, the implementation is largely motivated by boundary element method, uh, but so far it's it's limited to two dimensions. And there is another approach by by Bonito and 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 this Texas A&M group, where which is motivated by this Cato formula that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'll not get into de more details. Uh, we have recently developed a spectral approach, which works in arbitrary dimensions and for arbitrary domains. And the eva operator evaluation is like n log n, uh, and you can solve a, a problem with 10 to the 7 unknowns. And mind you, this is a dense problem, fully dense. You're not talking about sparse system. In in 15 minutes, uh, you assemble, uh, you 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 evaluate you. Uh, you you can easily apply using this this uh, this approach uh, the operator to a vector and then you can use CG or 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 something like that to solve the problem. That's that's what um, that's that's what we did. So just to illustrate an an, an example here, you are given a, a problem with the right hand side one in a unit ball. Uh, this was the problem that I mentioned earlier where we, where we know the exact solution. And you can solve the problem in in uh, in two D or 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 in three D, and uh, we know the ex explicit solution in this case, so it, it works out very well. So on the left side, we see the exact solution. On the right hand side is the application of the operator onto the discrete solution, and we should get one as as expected. So these were some some implementation aspects. So 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 far, what we have discussed is I started with several applications of uh, fractional operators. And then uh, we 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 discuss how do you define these operators and uh, and and I give a quick uh, quick quick overview on on how to implement this. So what are the uh, approaches that are that that are available to you? Um, we are quite interested in optimal control problems or PD constraint optimization problems in our group. And uh, so. What is the PD constraint optimization problem? You are like one prototypical typical example is you are trying to match uh, some data, let's say u sub d, um, with u, which solves, let like in this case, an a, a semi-linear uh, PDE, let's say, where where there is a non-linearity coming in PDE because of f, and you are trying to ach achieve your goal by with the help of uh, an unknown uh, control variable c. So this is so your optimization variables are u and z, and um, it's it turned out it's not quite straightforward to use the classical techniques to solve these problems. Um, I will only say that for the moment, and I also want to emphasize that the control here is on the right hand side. If you want to know more details on this problem, I recommend uh, these these two uh, papers. Now comes the uh, the the so-called new notion of control for for um, so classically, if you're trying to solve, let's say, a diffusion equation in a domain, typically the control is either inside the domain or on the boundary of the domain. Now, um, but with these fractional operators, since uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of beginning of the talk, that you need to have information about the function everywhere. So this. Um, allows actually this provides you flexibility to to introduce a, a new notion of control and that's what we did where you can have a control not only on the boundary or inside but you can have a control far away so you are you can do a control from far away and that's what we call the exterior uh, control so this is a new notion of control that we were able to introduce by using uh, these these operators uh, there are a lot of technicalities involved, uh, which you can find in in these publications. So so far, these problems that we, we that I just discussed, these control problems, the control is either um, in e either inside the domain or in the exterior, which is this new notion of control that we introduced. Uh, but in 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 reality, you also have a different class of problems where the where you you may have some bounds on on the solution to the PDE, which is what we call the state constraint problems, and these problems are very very delicate. Uh, one challenge is that if you if you look at such a prop such a constraint, then then your adjoint equation has measure on the right hand side, so you need to uh, analyze problems with 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 measures on the right hand side. 
it becomes quite challenging to design, not only analysis from the analysis point of view, but also it becomes challenging to design algorithms to solve these type of problems. So we have looked at that and we have an algorithm based on a Moro-Yoshida regularization in, 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 in recent couple of papers that, that uh, you can find here. And all the examples that I showed you so far, uh, we assumed that the fractional exponent was given to, to us, right? So, but that's not the case in reality. So if we don't know what this fractional exponent is, so you could model this as a random variable and uh, that leads to a random variable objective function j, which you can scalarize, let's say, by using this, this operator r. It could be the expected value, but we look at a more general formulation of the so-called risk uh, averse measure. One example is uh, mean plus MI deviation. So you're, you have a mean and you're trying to minimize the deviations above the mean value. You have a max operator. If I remove max and remove this zero, and you just get the usual um, deviation that, that you look at. But uh, here we are looking at the semi-deviation. And uh, the challenge is that these type of problems, as you can see, the objective function is naturally non-smooth in general. So it's not so obvious to design algorith optimization algorithms to solve these type of problems. For, for fractional operators, and the, the key challenge was that you're trying to uh, solve this problem and your function space is uh, HS, it's not H1, sublip space. And now your uh, function space has randomness itself in the definition of your function space. Uh, so how do, you, how do you analyze this problem and how do you design algorithms for that? Uh, this is a work that uh, just appeared in SAM Journal of Math, Control and Optimization, together with Drew Kuri from Sendia National Lab and a former postdoc of mine, Johannes Pfefferer, who is now at uh, TU Munich. So in, in this direction, uh, not quite related to, to, to what I just talked about, uh, we have we started a project uh, together with my collaborator, uh, Reinald Lohner, actually last year, after uh, the shutdown in March, so, um, so my wife, she's a, she's a nurse in ICU, and uh, I learned from her that they were having hard time um, creating negative pressure flows in their hospital. Um, so I I spoke with Reinald, and then uh, we 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 came up with um, some 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 uh, simulations in in hospital rooms, and also um, this 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 further led to simulations. In a, in a classroom at our university, for example, uh, we have recently done uh, airflow simulations in um, in in aeroplanes as well, and 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 you can see the effect actually. So here, what's going on is a student uh, sneezed in the middle of the classroom, and uh, he or she was not wearing a mask. Uh, windows were closed, and after after like two minutes, one twenty seconds, so the particles are everywhere in the room. So these are the, uh, the, these particles could potentially contain COVID. In the second image, the student was uh, wearing a mask and you see the effect actually that the, there are only a few particles. In the third, the student was not wearing a mask, but the windows were open and you see there are only fewer particles. And in the last image, the student was, um, wearing a mask and the windows were open and you see there are only a few particles so it really has an effect um, so this 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 work uh, and, and also the some of the other stuff that we have done recently is 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 done by combining fluid dynamics equations with 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 uh, particle models and also combining with computational crowd dynamics because we also allow people to move uh, as well has appeared in, uh, in 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 New York Times a couple of times and also appeared on 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 NBC. We have worked closely with Department of Justice as well uh, in 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 Maryland in New York Southern District and New York Eastern District, and have uh, helped them redesign courtrooms. Um, so in 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 US, it turned out there are there are rules that that um, the wit witness cannot wear a ma mask. So we want, and you want to protect the jury, right? So, and how how am I connecting it to the previous problem? 
that these problems that that we have looked at they contain a lot of uncertainty so they have pds and under, under uncertainty and uh, i i ha i included this slide just to to make people aware that there are a lot of uh, interesting questions out there when it comes to optimization problems uh, with pds that contain uncertainty it's not quite related to to the subject that i'm discussing today okay so we from coming back to the fractional uh, operators we looked at some other um, things in this direction as well. We designed multigrid algorithms to solve uh, these type of optimal control problems. Um, we looked at more sophisticated PDEs, let's say with, 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 with P-Laplace and how do you uh, analyze those problems and design algorithms to solve them. We have, we have also looked at the so-called uh, quasi-variation inequalities. So if you know your classical obstacle problem, that's your typical variation inequality where, um, where where you have, uh, let's say you don't want your solution to 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 um, cross a certain threshold, but the quasi variation inequality is more challenging because your obstacle can change uh, with solution as well. Uh, we have some some recent results in this direction, in particular uh, a, a new paper in uh, SIA math analysis. We also developed some reduced basis uh, approaches to solve these PDs that I mentioned earlier um, more efficiently. Okay, so I mean, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned uh, this minimization problem, which was the image denoising problem. But here I am looking at a more more generic problem, where where I've introduced this operator K. In case of tomographic tomographic reconstruction, for instance, this K could be uh, radon transform, and and here the goal is to identify the exponent s and and the regularization parameter alpha. And we did that together with with uh, with Wendy D from Argonne National Lab and and my former student Ratna Khatri. This work is published in Inverse Problems. And we design and so basically a bi-level optimization uh, sort of neural network to to solve this problem. Um, unfortunately, given the time constraint, I'm going to skip this part and and get get to the next 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 part of the talk, uh, which is uh, related to deep neural networks and relations to these fractional operators um, and and it's basically a new new type of fractional operator. So. I know some of you, many of you guys are interested in this type of problems. I know Yong Su is interested in this problem in particular. So you are given uh, a forward problem, let's say a parameterized PDE where C is your parameter. Um, for the for simplicity, let's consider F a discrete a nonlinear uh, parameterized PDE operator. C is the, the, the parameter and you, um, and let's say you are interested in this parameter to solution map. So you want to solve this problem over and over for different parameters. And we know that it can be quite challenging, especially if you have to solve this many, many times. Um, and if you are working with a, with a finite element space, which is uh, large. Um, so how do you proceed? You want to generate a surrogate, right? Uh, one, so one approach is, um, you use reduced basis method or you use POD approach or you use the discrete empirical interpolation method. Uh, but then there are other approaches like uh, pins, for example. Uh, is, or, or, or there are other, other type of approaches like um, which, which are more popular in, 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 in classification rather than, than PDE is, for instance, res, residual neural network. Or we introduce we have introduced this so-called fractional deep neural network, which I will describe shortly. So the goal here is to to extend this work that we did earlier, uh, and apply it apply and solve this type of uh, parameterized PDEs efficiently. So what is this uh, fractional uh, deep neural network? So let's go back to the basics. So you have. You, you you want to study this map from parameter to the PDE solution. So what do you need to have a supervised learning framework? You need a set of parameters, let's say C1 to C uh, and S and corresponding uh, solution vectors. Now you need this data anyways, if you want to do POD for instance as well, or, or what I call proper orthogonal decomposition. 
Now, the, what is the idea? The idea is um, you, you create a residual neural network as written here, you have L number of layers and you use this FL, uh, basic, you use the composition of all these uh, functions to, uh, to come up with a surrogate, which you call, call U hat C. So if you can fi if you can find this representation, then you don't need to go back and solve any PD anymore, right? So you can just evaluate this U hat for any parameter C and you're done. No more PDE evaluation needed. So you really replace that PDE by this um, surrogate. There are a couple of questions. How good is this U hat uh, approximate U? We do have partial, uh, partial results in, in our paper uh, which are based on this paper of Seagull and uh, Jin Chao Shu from uh, Penn State. And the next, so so this is an approximation theory question. So you can ask similar question when you're doing the finite element analysis before solving the problem. The next question is how do you determine uh, this parameter, uh, weights and biases? One way to do this is you use uh, optimization as uh, people typically do. So you solve a minimization problem subject to constraint. So it's a constraint optimization problem. I consider this as, as an ODE constraint optimization problem. And why is that? Because if you go back and you look at this middle equation, this is nothing but uh, your forward order discretization of an ODE, right? As written here. Uh, in, in our work, what we did was so, and, and, and we notice that here, right? So one layer is connected to the next and the information is propagating um, as, as, as you expect with, with, with the four, four dollar discretization of an ODE. So what we did was we replaced this, this standard time derivative by the so-called fractional time derivative. And this is another known local operator uh, because if you want to evaluate this at a point T, you need to have information about the function from zero to the current time. So all you need to go back all the way. So you track keeping track of the entire history. And this leads to a different type of network, which we call the fractional uh, deep neural network, which has this inbuilt history. So you know, we're replacing this ODE by the fractional ODE, right? And then we are discretizing it to come up with a new network. For classification problems, We've applied this uh, to 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 several sets of data. You can find it in 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 in, in this paper, and uh, for for um, yeah for for the Bayesian inverse problems, which I'm just going to describe uh, sh shortly. This is a recent work together with Howard Elman and uh, from from University of Maryland College Park, and uh, my postdoc uh, Akum and, and my former student uh, Dipanshu Verma. So in the first exam example, we are trying to infer two parameters, uh, C1 and C2, they're entering in the PDE in a nonlinear fashion. And uh, we, here we are seeing the uh, L infinity error when we are doing the training of our network, when we are using BFGS to do the training of the network. I'm talking about the fractional uh, deep neural network that I just described. And here are the number of BFGS iterations. We notice that after a few few uh, hundred iterations, the error, uh, and this is this is a generalization error, which is computed on the data that network has not seen before. After a while, um, this error does not uh, change much actually. So it, there's no point in, in over training your network. But in terms of CPU time, actually we see a significant gain. So the, if your full model is taking like 40 minutes, a fractional DNN is taking two minutes to, to, to find uh, these, these, these parameters. And this includes the training time as well. So this is not just the online time, this is offline time as well. The second example is a bit more challenging. Uh, it was taken from this paper of uh, Girlami, Lan, uh, Patrick Farrell, and, and, and um, Andy Stewart. And here we don't know the distribution of, of, of this um, coefficient but we only have certain boundary measurements as shown by these uh, circles. And again, the, the gain that we see is, is quite significant from three hours to uh, 18 minutes. 
So if you ask me if you have, you have complete theory for this, uh, we don't, I don't think anybody does, but I think these results are somewhat encouraging. So in the last part of the talk, uh, or last uh, three, four minutes, I want to sh show you another application of of uh, of of this this this, this deep neural network uh, networks that we have developed to the so-called chemical reacting flows. So this is a quite a challenging problem. I know many people care about this, um, and this is a joint work with uh, with my colleague uh, Ren Renal Donner uh, and Fumi Togahashi from Applied Simulation Inc. It's a um, small company in in um, small defense contractor in in Washington D.C. area. And a postdoc Thomas Brown and uh, and a PhD student Dipan Sharma, who just graduated. So here, uh, we are. If you try to let's say do capture the uh, ethanol combustion, so you need to um, solve set of stiff ODEs, um, and then you need to solve uh, fluid dynamics equations. But it turned out that the solver is taking 99% 99 99% of solver's time is spent on solving this uh, stiff ODEs. So the idea is to try to replace uh, a chemical reaction packages like Chemkin by deep neural networks. And uh, I mean, the, the results that we got were, were, were somewhat mixed and uh, you can see more details in this paper, which is an archive, which actually just got accepted. But let me show you a um, couple of examples. So in this first example, uh, we have 13 reactions in total we did training on five reactions, and then we did testing on eight reactions, and we looked at uh, different species plus temperature, and then um, we basically our 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 network is learning the solution at the next time step, and then we do time marching using uh, our our um, network, and the results that we get are are reasonable, right? So if you have um, so blue is the the actual actual curve that you want to get, and dotted curve is what you get if you use this DNN approach. And it's very easy to miss uh, this this transition. It's actually not so easy problem for for deep neural networks. And apparently, this this resonance that I described um, can do a reasonable job. And again, the challenge is that you see the the scale of the the time scale is 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 so small. So they, there is it's like nothing happening, nothing happening. Then all of a sudden, something happens, and then nothing happens. Um, and even sometimes the magnitude of the solution can be pretty small as well. So uh, this is a promising research direction, and there are there are several things happening in this in 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 in, in this direction. This work is uh, supported by a DTRA. I, I think I don't think I don't think I mentioned that. But anyways, I think I've um, exhausted all my time. So I will summarize. Uh, I started with several applications of uh, fractional operators in in imaging, in uh, geophysics, in in fractional diffusion maps. Um, some were data science related problems and some were uh, physics related problems. We, I quickly mentioned some of our work on, on, on optimal control of these PDEs, uh, in particular semi-linear problems. Uh, we have done some work on quasi-linear problems and have looked at also state constraint problems. In case the fractional exponent is not known, you could model it as a random variable, which leads to a random uh, um, to, to a random variable objective function, and that leads to uh, further challenges. Uh, you can find details in, in our paper, this SIAM control and optimization paper. And then we also looked at uh, this, we introduced this new operator where S is not a constant anymore, but it's a function of X, and that provides you extra fl flexibility. I discussed some of our work on uh, fractional deep neural networks and quickly mentioned this application related to chemical reacting flows. So thank you very much for your attention.